I speak to you in the name of God, who created magnificently, and of his Son, Jesus, who died violently, and of the Holy Spirit, who descended upon us powerfully. Amen. It's very nice to be with you. I want to thank Don for inviting me to be, on, to be your honorary assistant here at uh, St. Anne's. I've got a long connection with St. Anne's. My last parish was the Church of the Epiphany in St. Mark, just next door. And we worked together with uh, sponsoring refugees through, uh, through Aura. And you'll get to know me over a bit of time, and Don and I are going to figure out what exactly I'm going to be doing here. I'm looking forward to being with you very much. It's harvest. It's Thanksgiving. Who do you need to return to to say thanks? Returning to say thanks. Earlier this week, I was at the optometrist. He's a lovely guy. I live on the Danforth. He's, uh, he's a Greek guy, and he serves the Greek community. He's the sweetest fellow, indeed. And I sat down for my uh, semi-annual checkup just to make sure everything's working. And in a couple of weeks, you can look forward to a sporting new pair of glasses. We started talking about how good life is. He did. And maybe it's the season of Thanksgiving for him. But we checked in with each other and asked how each other is doing, if our families have been COVID safe. And then he went on to be so grateful to be living in this country for the health and safety of his family, to have a good job, and to have a good government that served him as he had to close his business for a time. It was lovely to hear him just spontaneously be thankful and be grateful. It's a very good quality. And it reminded me, too, of that wonderful book by Dorothy Butler Bass, Gratitude, the Transformative Power of Giving Thanks. She's a wonderful writer. She tells wonderful, wonderful stories. And in the opening chapter of that book, Grateful, she tells the story of a parishioner of hers who did a marvelous act of kindness to her and greatly assisted her in a ministry that she had been trying to sort of get up and running. Diana wrote this parishioner a nice thank you note, a thoughtful thank you note, more than just thank you for your help but took the time to write a proper thank you note the next week. She got a thank you note from the woman that she sent the thank you note to. And she asked herself, when is thanks enough? How often do we have to say thanks? And it sparked for her some new thoughts which ultimately turned into this book, Grateful, the transformative power of giving thanks. Who do you need to give thanks to? Who do you need to return to give thanks? The gospel story is probably well known to us. In that gospel story, we know Jesus was walking along and ten lepers, ten outcasts, ten diseased individuals came up to him and asked to be healed. And as Jesus does, he healed them all. And because of the rules and the rituals of Jesus' day, he sent them off to the priests because it was the priests who kind of acted like doctors to pronounce if someone is officially cured and then can be integrated back into the community. So Jesus sent the ten lepers off to the priests so that they could be pronounced cured. And as we know that story and as we like that story so much, we notice that one of the ten actually returns to give thanks to Jesus. He prostrates himself 
and thanks Jesus. And Jesus wonders where the other nine are. They forgot to say thanks. They were so into their own healing, and I don't blame them one little bit. But Jesus does remark on the power of this man's gratitude and how it was beginning to transform him. He was thinking outside of himself. Outside of himself. He was grateful. He returned to say thanks. To whom do you need to return to say thanks? I spent my high school years in the small town of Espanola, Ontario. Does anybody know it? Oh yes, good, good, <laughs> good. I spent my high school years, my dad was the United Church minister at Espanola United Church, an original name for United Church, Espanola United Church. Our manse, which is what we call it in United Church language, our manse was literally right beside the church. You could stand between the church, the west wall of the church, and the east wall of the manse and touch. We were that close. One of the things that my dad established at that church was a clothing bank and a food bank. Not necessarily for the people in town, but because Espanola, being west of Sudbury, north of Manitoulin Island, being on the Trans-Canada Highway, often hosted transient people people who were hitchhiking, and that was back in the 70s, right, when we could all hitchhike, hitchhiking from one end of the country to the next. And there actually became a bit of a pattern. In the spring and in the fall, people, women and men who were homeless or suffered with addiction or alcoholics or whatever, they would hitchhike from the east and from, uh, from Ontario, Quebec and Ontario, and make their way out to Vancouver or Victoria, where it was milder, where they would overwinter. And then in the spring, they would migrate back. My dad and the church at Espanola United Church noticed that there was this pattern, so that is why they set up a clothing bank and a food bank. And it would be typical that many times over the course of the fall and the course of the spring there would be a knock at our door or our doorbell would go and the dog would bark and my dad would get up it was always at dinner time, always at dinner time my dad would get up and go to the door and see to it whoever it was who needed help and if it was a transient he would take them next door he would give them the clothes they needed, the food they wanted, and they had a bit of a slush fund for uh, bus tickets, and they would pay for a bus ticket from Espanola to Sault Ste. Marie, get them partially on their way. Where our dining room was situated, and where we typically sat, and my family always sat at the dinner, dining room table for dinner every evening, and just like you have your favorite pews and your favorite places to sit in church on Sunday, we always sat in the same place. My dad sat at the end, traditional family, and I sat to his right. But where we were, where the dining room was situated, I could, where I sat, I could actually see the front door. So when the doorbell did go and someone needed dad's attention, dad would get up and I could see who was at the front door. And one evening, a fellow whose name I do not remember, but I'm going to call him Fred for the purposes of this story, the doorbell rang, and it might have been 1975, the doorbell rang, it was the fall, it was October, the doorbell rang, and Fred was at the door. My dad got up, he opened the door, and I could see Fred standing on the doorstep. I could see that dad talked with him and then he called to my mom said he'd be back in a few minutes 
and he closed the door and presumably he went over to the church and got him some food or got him a bus ticket or got him some clothing, whatever it is he needed. And dad was a little bit of time, his dinner got cold. But obviously dad had had a good conversation with Fred. And Fred went on his way. The following spring, though, the doorbell rang, and Dad got up, and as he opened the door, I could see that there was a man standing in front of him, and it was indeed Fred. Fred began to make it a bit of a pattern. In the spring, he would return to the East Coast, and in the fall, he would make his way out west. I remember one year, my dad asked me, after Fred had been through, how old do you think he is? Because I think at that point, I had answered the door. And dad went with him and came back and he said to me, how, how old do you think he was? Well, I was 19 at the time, so anyone over 30 is ancient, right? Do you know what I mean? I said, well, he's probably 80 or 90. Well, he was 45. But he was so rough. He was so broken. He was dirty. Spring and fall, fall and spring, the doorbell would go, the dog would bark, dad would get up from the table, and dad would meet, greet, and serve Fred. It was December 1979. I remember it so clearly because the Christmas tree was up and we were sitting at the table and the doorbell didn't go but dad just happened to mention that he hadn't seen Fred this year. We had no way of knowing where Fred ended up or where Fred was. I don't even know if my dad knew his last name. But dad just remarked that we hadn't seen Fred and just generally said, I hope he's okay. Christmas came and went. And then in April, after Easter, the doorbell rang. The dog barked. My dad got up from the dining room table and opened the door. And there was Fred, but it was a different Fred. It was a Fred who was all cleaned up. He was clean, shaved. He had a jacket on, an overcoat, and a duffel bag. My dad again, of course, greeted him. Fred, so good to see you. We haven't seen you in a year. How are you? The friend said, I'm fine, sir. I'm fine. I'm very fine, sir. Can I get you some clothing? He says, no. He says, I'm all cleaned up. I'm taking care of myself now. Do you need a, a, a bus ticket to get to Toronto? No. He says, I've got a bus ticket. And he patted his breast pocket. Do you need food? My wife could make you a sandwich. No, he said, I'm, I'm fine. An awkward silence. And my dad said, well, Fred, what can I do for you? He said, nothing. He said, I've spent the winter in Calgary, and I reunited with my sister. I joined AA and got a job as a short order cook. That's wonderful. So what can we do for you, Fred? He said, absolutely nothing. I've just returned to say thanks. To whom do you need to return to say thanks? 
Amen.